Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lee Allward at the University of Iowa, and I am going to be uh, talking to you today about gonioscopy and techniques for difficult angles. I have no conflicts to report regarding this lecture. I, I have written a book and I have a website regarding gonioscopy, uh, but remarkably, I don't get any income from either of those. And also, I'm going to talk about lenses that I use, but I have no financial relationship with any lens manufacturer. So my department buys my lenses for me. I don't have any sense that the particular brand of four mirror lens that I use is superior in any way to other brands. So it just happens to be the one that I have in my, in my white coat. Really, uh, gonioscopy is a really important tool for, you, for us all to know how to use. It allows us to look directly at the pathology and to see what's going on. And, and I am hoping that by the end of this lecture, you'll be excited about gonioscopy. You wanna grab your lens and go look at things. You know, you can see great stuff with gonioscopy. We, this is a patient who had intermittently blurred vision and, um, and we could happen to catch him right at the time when we could see him bleeding from his old cataract wound. It's a pretty cool video. A patient with angle recession. You guys had a lot of questions about angle recession, um, but this, and I'll show more towards the end. But what's really great about this video is this patient has so many iris processes that you can actually see where the angle recession starts and where it ends. Because here there are no iris processes, but as I, as I come around, you will see where the processes start up right there. Patient with neovascularization. One of your questions was, how do you know what's neovascularization? New vessels will cross the scleral spur and will branch on the other side of the spur. So you know, these are clearly not physiologic blood vessels. A patient with red eye, kind of big vessels. And when we put on the gonio lens, you can see clearly blood and Schlem canal. A patient has unilateral glaucoma. Eye looks okay until you lift the lid. It looks a little less okay now. And this is an eye that has the angle completely full of melanoma. So we're gonna talk about indirect gonioscopy today and, and specialize on techniques for, for difficult angles. So there, there are two main types of indirect lenses. There are the Goldman style lenses, as you can see on the left, okay. and the four mirror style lenses. The, the old prototype was the Zeiss lens. Uh, it's really not made anymore, but you'll see it crop up in my, uh, in my talk periodically. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both of these. And I think that um, it's important to understand those because actually I think it's really useful to have both lenses available. The Goldman style lenses are, I think, easier to use uh, and the view is spectacular. These are the lenses, the Goldman style lenses are the lenses that you're gonna use for photography or for laser treatment. So those are the advantages. And, and I think that if you're looking with a four mirror lens and you just really want a better view, I wouldn't hesitate to pull out a Goldman style lens and use that to, to give you a different view. Um, the downsides of the Goldman lens is it's more inconvenient because you need to use a coupling solution. Um, it's because it has such a big area of contact, you can't indent easily with this lens. And the last point there is clinic flow. 
So in my clinic, you know, patients come in, you know, they have their vision and pressure checked um, and we would do an exam and then send them off for visual fields and maybe OCT or photography. But if they have coupling fluid, if they have methyl cellulose on their cornea, then the photographers and the perimeters are not gonna be happy with you. You're not gonna get good results. So if you can do form gonioscopy without messing up their photography or their field. So the clinic flow piece to me is a big piece of this. And if you have a true three mirror Goldman lens, it's the shortest of the mirrors that is the one that's designed for looking at the angle. The other mirrors are more designed for peripheral retina. This is a, a lens called a MagnaView lens. Uh, if you're at either of my websites, almost all my movies were done with this kind of a lens. It, it has only one mirror, uh, but this mirror has a little bit of magnification, like 1.1x. It's not a big, uh, a big magnification, but it's a lens that I like. There are special lenses like the rich lens and the Latina lens that are designed uh, for laser treatment. And there are many, many more. The four mirror lens has the advantage of being convenient and anything that's convenient, you're gonna do more often. Uh, it's much easier to see the whole angle. You don't need to rotate the lens very much. I think a big key here is it's great for indentation. And we're gonna emphasize indentation in this lecture. It's harder to master. Uh, so it's, I think it, when I watch my residents use the four mirror lens, they're often pushing way too hard. Uh, so it requires a very light touch. So corneal folds should not be part of your normal exam. So if you have a really strong grip on the lens and you're really pushing hard to keep up with the patient who's moving around, you'll see corneal folds and that means you'll never see a narrow angle in your life, right? So the, the touch with the, with the four mirror lens should be very, very light. And I know that when my, my residents watch me through the side scope, it's a little irritating for them because I, uh, there's often air flashing underneath the, the lens because I'm trying to hold it just so delicately that I'm not um, accidentally indenting all the time. But you can see with just one, you know, without moving the lens, you can see most of the angle. If you just rotate it a few degrees, you can pick up what's in these areas here. So it can be very fast. So there's a Posner style lens, uh, and then there's a Sussman style lens. Uh, they're both four mirror lenses. They're both excellent. I use a Posner lens. Most of my partners use Sussman lenses. It, uh, I think it's just whatever you're more comfortable with. I do think that if one has uh, shorter arms, the Posner lens is probably easier to use uh, than the Sussman lens. And alternatively, if you're very, very tall, this might be easier to use. I would try both of them, see which is most comfortable for you. Somebody asked about, uh, and by the way, thank you for all the great questions that you guys sent in. Somebody asked about the six mirror lens and, and there is a six mirror lens. I have tried it. I don't personally uh, like it very much um, be, um, because each of the mirrors is so short. Um, and, but I don't see any real disadvantage to it either. So people ask what I use, this is what I use. Um, I don't think this is necessarily better than lenses by Volk or any other manufacturers, but several people wanted to know what I have in my pocket. And this is the lens I have right now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about general techniques uh, of, of how to do gonioscopy. You get to meet my daughters through this. I set up uh, the patient so that they are at the canthal mark. I'm going to go back because I think people don't pay attention enough. This mark should be lined up with the lateral canthus because you need the full excursion going up and back. This is a little bit older video. This is a Zeiss lens. Again, that's a, a Sussman lens. 
The Zeiss lens was great, but it's very fragile. And this is the Posner. And so there are four mirrors, as I'm pointing out here. Um, for some reason, I'm pointing it out twice. But, um, and, and then this is just showing that the Posner, Sussman, Zeiss lenses are smaller. The area of contact is a lot smaller than with the Goldman lens. And that's important for indentation or dynamic gonioscopy. <clears throat> it's very hard to indent with the gold moments. So this is me continuing the exam. Um, you can see uh, her angle, she's a myope and her angles are open. And I can just go around, she's a, since uh, this is a young woman, her angles have almost no pigment in them. The dark band you see there is the ciliary body band. And notice that I have my three fingers against her cheek and the lens being held gently between my index finger and thumb. And here I'm just indenting just to show how to indent. But it's important for you as the examiner to be still. That means I am braced against the patient's face and my elbow is on the table. If I'm doing a Goldman style lens, it's important to fill the lens concavity with viscoelastic, uh, not viscoelastic, excuse me, methyl cellulose. You can do that, you need to do that without bubbles. So either start a stream on a tissue and move it over, or I usually just break that little dropper by, cap out and just dump it in. But it's important that there are no bubbles in there. And I put the bottom of the lens in first and then flip this up. And I've trained myself to hold the lens with three fingers so that I don't ever have to use my other lens and bring or my other hand and bring my other hand around uh, to help with this. So it's good to learn this technique. Two fingers against the patient's face. The other three fingers are rotating the lens. see some iris processes here. Someone asked about iris processes versus PAS. So iris processes should follow the concavity of the angle and they shouldn't pull the iris up uh, like a PAS or peripheral anterior synechia would do. All right, so I'm just turning this lens. And then obviously my other hand is on the slit lamp controls because you have to keep up with the lens. And I do think this is a better view with the three mirror lens. Um, but I don't think it's enough better view uh, to make me uh, to make me want to use it routinely. And then I'm, if I if it doesn't come off easy, push against the globe to break that seal. One of you asked how much illumination is advisable when doing gonioscopy? Is it best to be done in a dark room? You certainly don't want to flood the eye with light, but uh, it doesn't need to be a totally black room. It doesn't need to be totally dark. The exception would be when we talk about the corneal wedge. And when you're doing the corneal wedge, it's really good to have a dark room, but we'll get to that. So don't worry about it being totally dark, uh, just dim. So when I came to the University of Iowa, I discovered all these paintings by this incredible artist, Lee Allen. And life would be easy if everything looked like this, right? Um, but a lot of times it's hard. Uh, I, a lot of times gonioscopy is hard, still hard for me a lot of the times. And so, and especially be nice if they came with labels like this. Um, and so I'm gonna talk, the thrust of what we're gonna talk about today is what to do if the view is difficult. And so I'm gonna talk about these five techniques, but really want you to leave here this uh, hour together trying the corneal wedge. Some people call this the parallelopiped. I could never spell that. So I call it the corneal wedge because that's what Lee Allen called it. Uh, and indentation gonioscopy or dynamic gonioscopy. So the first thing I would say is when I start gonioscopy, I always look at the inferior angle. I start with the, that means I'm looking in the upper mirror because the inferior angle is the deepest. It's the most pigmented because of gravity. 
and it's easiest to use the corneal wedge in the upper and lower mirror. So I always start looking in the upper mirror at the lower angle. Once you get your bearings, once you know where all the structures are, because it's so nicely pigmented down here, you can figure out the rest of the angle. You don't need the pigment so much anymore. One of the, uh, somebody asked about using the corneal wedge in the lateral mirror. So the temporal and nasal mirror are, are much harder to use. Uh, is it possible to do the corneal wedge in those mirrors? It is. You have to actually tilt the illumination part of the slit lamp. It requires a lot of gymnastics. I never do it. I wouldn't really recommend trying it. It is, but it is possible. Uh, again, if you use the wedge, and which we're going to talk about next, to identify the angle structure, because the wedge is showing me the Schwalbe line is right here, then I can take that knowledge and uh, transfer that knowledge to the rest of the exam. So start off in the upper mirror. So what is a corneal wedge? The corneal wedge is a way of identifying Schwalbe line, the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork. And so to do this, again, it's good to have a room that's pretty dark, offset the um, ocular. So the ocular is going straight ahead. The light source is offset, just like you're doing um, a uh, Van Herrick test, which we'll talk about later on. And when you do that, uh, it breaks the light up on the cornea. So you have a beam on the inside and a beam on the outside. So the one on the inside is usually very crisp and, uh, and sharp. And the one on the outside is sort of fat and fuzzy. And they, they illuminate the front and back of the cornea until they run out of cornea. And then they illuminate the interface between cornea and sclera. And it comes back and they join right at Schwalbe line. So this is a great technique. Um, it, I will admit at the front, it's a hard technique. Uh, but uh, if you are struggling to find out where Schwalbe line is, this is the way you do it. And this is the kind of eye that you struggle with, I struggle with, right? This is like a 15 year old person. They have zero pigment in their angle. How do you find where the trabecular meshwork is? Now in Lee Allen's paintings, he always makes Schwalbe line look like something. It never looks like anything, right? It rarely looks like anything. But by using the cornea wedge, we know that this is Schwalbe line right here. And so let me show you a video example. This is a young boy, 14-ish, um, zero pigment in his angle, right? But you can see this inner crisp beam and this outer fat fuzzy beam, and they come together right there. So that tells me that's the beginning of my trabecular mesh work. Without this, without the corneal wedge, I would just be guessing at where his trabecular mesh work is. So again, you, you're using a light that's offset from your oculars, a narrow bright beam and in a pretty dark room because the darkness does help with this. But I think this is a great example of, um, of finding the corneal wedge and finding Schwabe line in somebody with no pigment. And, and it can be just as big a problem if you have too much pigment, right? Like this eye. I have no idea what's going on here. Lots of pigment lines. Uh, which one is the pigmented trabecular meshwork? Where does uh, where Schwalbe line? And again, I follow these two until they join right about there. So this is a sample AC line. Another angle. I have no idea what I'm looking at here, right? But this is the anterior board of the trabecular meshwork right there. And so this is the mesh work. It's, uh, some of these are really, really hard. Um, fat, fuzzy, sharp, come together right there. And they show me that's the anterior border of my mesh work.
This is a little bit off center, sorry about that, but this is an angle, it's very narrow and the beams come together just barely above the iris. So this is an angle that's very, very close, but not close, or very, very narrow, excuse me, but not close. And this is an angle that's closed. And so the uh, inner and outer lines on the cornea run parallel like railroad tracks and they never come together. So this is what the, the corneal wedge would look like in somebody who has um, a closed angle. So tip number one, I, I struggled with this. In fact, when Mr. Allen, the guy who did all that great artwork was alive, I asked him how he always found a corneal wedge because it's always in every one of his paintings. And what he told me to do, which is hugely helpful, is to have the patient look slightly away from the examining mirror, right? Mm -hmm. when, and people in, uh, in the questions that you sent in were asking about looking over the hill, which used to be part of this lecture because in the past when we had people on pilocarpine, they would have some relative Bombay, uh, but their angle wasn't closed, but you had to kind of look over that Bombay to see the angle. So to do that, you would have them look into the mirror and so by having them look into the mirror, I'm now looking up over that hill into the angle. Um, since we have virtually nobody on pilocarpine anymore, I, I kind of dropped that from this lecture, but it's the, it's the same concept. In this case, you want to look more into the angle. To do the cornea wedge, you really want to look more onto the cornea. So have the patient look just slightly away from the examining mirror and that will put you up on the cornea and it, the, suddenly it will appear. Uh, tip number two, don't, please don't wait till you need this to start dusting this off. Uh, you just, when, if you have a clinic that's slowing down and <clears throat> you have a few minutes, do gonioscopy on one of the patients and find the cornea wedge. Do this on dozens of patients until you realize that you can find the wedge. Don't wait until you have that patient where you can't see the mesh work. And now I uh, figure it out now. You, you really have to practice this technique. The other thing I want you to go out of this talk with is indentation gonioscopy in your pocket, right? Um, some people call this dynamic gonioscopy, manipulative gonioscopy, other things. It, it doesn't really matter. The concept is that you have a lens with a small area of contact. Um, and then when you, and so this is an angle that's closed, right? And so when I indent, this side remains closed because it's got a peripheral anterior sneakia. This side opens up uh, because it was just in Bombay. It's important to know that. So sneakia there, wide open there. You need a lens with a small area of contact. Again, this is the Zeiss lens, Posner lens, Sussman lens, any of these lenses would be great. And you can see here that the, the, these lenses, the four mirror lenses have a much smaller area of contact. So some people say they can indent with a Goldman. I, I find it very difficult. And what I'm doing here is I'm just pushing gently. I don't have to push hard, I just push gently and I can just watch the iris move back. And again, practice is just doing gonioscopy, you know, consciously move the iris around so you get good at this. Don't wait until you have someone where you're trying to sort out whether they're in Bombay or sinequally closed. So this is an angle in which we see no structures. When I indent, there's the trabecular meshwork. You see all these corneal folds, right? The corneal folds, again, should not be part of your normal exam. They should only be seen when you're intentionally indenting somebody. This is a patient very narrow. I don't know what this is. I don't think it's trabecular meshwork, but I'm gonna indent and see what I find. As I indent, well, that's clearly meshwork back here. Right, that was just a Sam Palacy line. It opens beautifully when I release the pressure. All that goes away. And now I can see the meshwork again. You would assume, I would assume that this is somebody, if I did an iridotomy on them, they would do 
that angle, I, I would hope, would open up nicely. I like this video. This is an angle that doesn't look that bad, you know? So I, I would say that looks like meshwork scleral spur. I'm gonna do tra laser trabecular plasty blast along here. Uh, but when I indent this eye, that was not the trabecular meshwork, right? That was a sample AC line. That's what I thought was meshwork and spur. That's actually trabecular meshwork there and scleral spur there. So I would have just welded the uh, angle together if I hadn't done indentation and determined where the actual trabecular meshwork was. This is a patient that has synechia on the right side, open on the left. Just a video example of the same thing. So I'm indenting here. You can see the left side of the, screen, of the image stays closed and the right side opens up. When I release the pressure, it just all looks closed. When I push, it opens on the right. And again, I'm showing the corneal folds here because you just really want to be careful. You don't see those all the time. And this is the lower mirror, upper angle, same thing. There's a lot of sneak you there and parts that do open up with indentation. The other time, the other situation in which I find uh, indentation to be really, really helpful is for plateau iris syndrome. Uh, you could do ultrasound by a microscopy, I guess, to make this diagnosis, but you could also make it with your gonio lens that you have in your pocket. So this is somebody who has a very anterior ciliary body. Um, and what that does is it gives them an angle that the anterior chamber looks pretty deep in the center, but drops off markedly in the periphery. If we did a Van Herrick test, which we're going to talk about in a minute, basically it would show us that the anterior chamber looked pretty normal, or that the anterior chamber depth looked pretty normal. So it would miss plateau iris. And, and what do we see when we indent? So you can imagine that you've got this ciliary body holding everything up here. You've got the lens holding everything up here. If you just push down on the iris, it would drape over the lens and drape over the ciliary body and give you this sort of sine wave or double hump pattern. So if you indent, and instead of the iris just going back like this, the iris has this ridge or lump in the periphery, <clears throat> then you should be thinking plateau iris. So here's a patient, central chamber is pretty deep, periphery is pretty narrow. And when I indent, I can see this hump in the periphery, this iris roll. You can see the meshwork a little bit. Show a few video examples of this. As I push here, you can in your mind's eye see that something is holding the iris up here in the periphery, that there's a lump under there, like something under the carpet. When I release, it goes away. And then when I push again, you can, you can imagine that there's something out there holding this iris forward. Just another example of the same thing, kind of a steep drop off in the periphery. And when I indent, you see the corneal folds. And this one, you really clearly see that there's something there. There's something beneath the iris. So I find this technique to be incredibly valuable for the plateau iris diagnosis. Van Herrick technique was, Van Herrick was invented many, many years ago, back when the only kind of gonioscopy was direct gonioscopy, where you had to lie a patient down in a separate room and use a ceiling mounted slit lamp to do gonioscopy. And so this was a way that they, Van Herrick came up with to estimate the anterior chamber depth by slit lamp exam. 
it is not a replacement for gonioscopy. As we just showed with plateau iris syndrome, you'd miss plateau iris for sure with this, but it's a great <clears throat> adjunct. And so it's, you know, I always do a Van Herrick whenever I look at anybody, I just unconsciously am trying to figure out how deep the angle is. So this is uh, my myopic daughter. And as I bring this lens or the light beam into the very periphery I use the thickness of the cornea as a ruler and compare that to the chamber depth. And you can see that she was deeper than her cornea is thick. This is a recessed angle, hugely deep. <clears throat> this is a very narrow angle, way less than the corneal thickness deep. And there are even areas here where the iris is touching. And then this is just flat. So you, you basically use <clears throat> The corneal thickness as a ruler, anything that's any chamber that's deeper than the than the cornea is thick is, is quite deep. Um, once you get down to half corneal thickness or less, then that's a pretty narrow angle. Um, and again, I would never replace gonioscopy is so easy to do once you have that four mirror lens in your pocket. But this is a way if you have say an angle that's very poorly unpigmented and you can't tell if it's wide open and you're uh, looking at unpigmented trabecular meshwork or if it's closed and you're just looking at cornea. Um, obviously the corneal wedge, but if you can't get the wedge to work, the Van Herrick might help you with that. So it's just a, a, a gross estimate of the angle depth. Examine the other eye. So if my residents come up and I and say, well, we have this patient, his cornea is, the pressure is 50, the cornea is cloudy, I can't see the trabecular meshwork, can't do gonioscopy, I always ask them two questions. What's a patient's refractive error? Because if they're a myope, then I'm less likely thinking that, that they're in acute pupillary block angle closure. Um, they should be a hyperope or emetrope. And the other is, what does the other angle look like? You're not going to do gonioscopy on this eye very easily, but <clears throat> if they're phacic in both eyes, the other angle should be pretty darn narrow, right? If the other angle is very deep, uh, then you have to rethink your diagnosis. This is a patient who, who has, so uh, we see pigmented trabecular meshwork here, scleral spur, really wide ciliary body face. So <clears throat> do they have angle recession? Or are they just a myo? Um, and helps to look at the other eye. And so when you look at the other eye, you can see that the ciliary body <clears throat> is lighter on this eye. And that's because we've torn into the ciliary body and there's less ciliary body between you and the sclera. And so usually in angle recession, it's lighter in color like we see here. Weirdly, sometimes it's darker. Don't ask me to explain that. I don't understand that. And you see iris processes in this uninvolved eye and there's none left in the involved eye. Um, a lot of questions about angle recession and, and the questions that you sent me. Uh, so the, these are the things that I'm looking for. If there are iris processes, they'd be broken. Uh, the scleral spur is usually brighter because there's nothing on top of it anymore. Um, and the ciliary body face is usually uh, lighter in color. So those, uh, these are some of your questions. I think I answered the first question. How much is significant? Uh, any amount of angle recession is significant. So the angle recession doesn't hurt the eye at all. What the angle recession is telling you is this eye has had bad trauma, right? It has torn the iris, uh, torn into the ciliary body face. And, and so you don't, the degree of angle recession is really not associated with the risk of glaucoma uh, the degree of angle recession uh, is kind of meaningless, but if there is angle recession, like if there's a sphincter tear or there's a voiceous ring, those are signs of bad trauma. And that's a sign of why this patient has glaucoma. Just another angle recession since there were so many questions about it. You can see the wide ciliary body face that's light in color. And these are actually little uh, dried up balls of old blood. Um, that's also helpful in making that diagnosis. And this is one where you can actually see a radial tear. So let me go through a few of your questions here. I hope that's been helpful to you. Um, 
these first two have to do with how do you grade things? And so there's several grading systems. Uh, there's a spath, I mean, there's a, yeah, spath, the Shea, Schaefer. I really like the spath system uh, beyond what I can talk about in this lecture. But if you go to this, my web, my curriculum website, there's a gonioscopy talk and I go through the spath system. But the spath system describes not only the uh, width of the angle, but also the height of the iris insertion and the shape of the iris. So I think it's, it's harder to learn, but it's really useful. How does anterior segment OCT fit in my practice? Um, I don't really use it very much. I use anterior segment ultrasound biomicroscopy more often because that lets me look beneath the iris. Uh, the OCT doesn't show me really much that I can't see with my gonio lens. Someone asked about manipulative versus indentation. I, in my mind, those are the same things, dynamic manipulative indentation. Uh, and we talked about how do you differentiate normal vessels? Those are usually circumferential. Neovascular vessels typically cross the scleral spur and branch, as we saw in that really great example at the beginning. Congenital glaucoma, uh, usually you would be using a direct lens, uh, like a, a Swan Jacobs lens or Kepi lens uh, with the operating microscope uh, to do exam in congenital glaucoma. But in answer to the second question, can you do it with a surgical microscope and a four-mirror lens? Yeah, you can. I mean, it would be a little bit more awkward, but I don't know why you, you could not do that. Can you do indentation in acute uh, attack? Um, you know, you, you can actually break an attack of glaucoma by pushing on the cornea with something small like a, a, a four mirror lens or an applinating tip. People have described doing that, um, but uh, pretty hard to see the angle if, the, if they're in acute attack, partly because of the edema. And can you break PAS? No, I don't think a, a true PAS is pretty tough to break with indentation. Uh, intraoperative goniosity is kind of beyond this uh, talk. And, and so how do you teach goniosity? I, I have, not to advertise, but I have two websites, goniosity.org and, and the Iowa Glaucoma Curriculum. Goniosity.org is just designed to teach goniosity. So you could send them there. Um, uh, we talked about edema. Iris strands and peripheral anterior synechia. How do you differentiate them? The iris strands should follow the concavity of the angle and they shouldn't pull up the iris, right? The synechia uh, bridge the angle. Often there's pigment anterior to the synechia and they distort the iris. And again, I wouldn't worry about the nasal and temporal angles. Um, you can make a slit, but it is gymnastic and not worth the effort. So figure out the anatomy by looking in the upper and lower mirrors, and then just use full field illumination to look in the lateral mirrors. Um, I wouldn't worry about doing a slit in the nasal temporal mirrors. What does a ciliary body look like on gonioscopy? You know, when, when gonioscopy is first discovered by Trontus, he was actually trying to look at the ciliary body and accidentally discovered that he could see the angle. Um, we don't usually see the ciliary body uh, doing gonioscopy. And I always tell my residents that if you see the ciliary body, something's wrong. You may not know what's wrong, but something's wrong. This is a patient who had uh, was pseudophagic and had a tube shunt done, as you can see there, and then fell and ejected their iris out through their phaco wound. But it gives us a great view of the ciliary body. Um, but the ciliary body in a normal eye is hidden by the iris. So you would see it, and this is traumatic aniridia, of course. You can see it in congenital aniridia. This is a spectacular view. Um, this is somebody with um, neovascularization of the angle, iris and angle, and it's pulled the iris up and out, and that allows you to see the ciliary processes there. 
But I would say anytime you put on a gonio lens and you see the ciliary body, you should be wondering why and what's wrong uh, that's causing you to have this view. If you have a big round lens like in spherophacia, sometimes that will let you see the ciliary body, but in a normal eye, you, you won't see it. So two websites that you may or may not have discovered already, uh, gonioscopy.org, it's been around for 15 years or so, strictly hundreds of movies of gonioscopy. So if you just wanna watch a lot of gonioscopy, uh, I would recommend that. Uh, my newer website, which is now five years old, is the Iowa Glaucoma Curriculum. And that is uh, 50 lectures, one of which is on gonioscopy and really has covers a lot of what we covered here today. Um, also covers everything about, about glaucoma. This is Payback. This is my daughter who I was doing all that gonioscopy on, who's now a glaucoma specialist and got to do gonioscopy on me. I have some examples here, but let me look at the question answers and see if there's anything here that we should answer before I move on. Uh, let's see, during gonioscopy, how visible is neovascularization? It's, uh, it's quite visible. I mean, it's, I think that you need to, um, you really need to pay attention. I'm a little red green colorblind, so I have to pay a lot of attention, um, uh, but, um, you should be able to see it. Um, I think we answered that question. Is it possible to treat nystagmus? I don't really know what that would have anything to do with gonioscopy. I mean, if the, if the patient has nystagmus, gonioscopy is, it can be a challenge. How much offset is needed for the corneal wedge? Just a little bit, 20 degrees or so. I don't think there's any magic number. Uh, just so you have that you find the front the enough to give you uh, two different beams when you do that. Uh, edematous cornea is hard. Uh, you can use topical glycerin. Um, uh, as I said before, sometimes you can, if, if uh, both eyes are fake, sometimes looking at the other eye is going to tell you a lot of what you need to do uh, or what you should be seeing. But an edematous cornea is hard. I mean, in the operating room, sometimes they'll scrape the cornea, but you obviously don't want to do that in the clinic. Uh, is there a digital non-invasive way to perform gonioscopy? Not that I'm aware of. Um, the, uh, there, you know, you can use anterior segment OCT to, to garner some information about the cornea or the uh, anterior segment depth. Although in a study looking at people with narrow angles predicting who would develop pressure rise, actually anterior segment OCT was less effective than gonioscopy. Um, and the disadvantage, I love anterior segment OCT. I think this technology is spectacular, but you, you can't see pigment, for example. Uh, so making the diagnosis of pigmentary or exfoliation would much, be much harder. Um, do we need anesthetic? Uh, I, I, yes, you do. Absolutely need a drop of anesthetic to do uh, gonioscopy. Does the coronavirus affect the work of the cellular body? Absolutely no idea. Um, I, I don't know that at all. Do we need to do gonioscopy only in glaucoma suspect patients? Uh, so anyone who's in a, you know, I only live in a glaucoma clinic, but um, we use gonioscopy for other things. I would say just a routine person who comes in for a refraction is nothing else going on. I bet they don't have gonioscopy performed. Um, any glaucoma patient absolutely needs to have gonioscopy performed. And in a study that was done uh, by Paul Lee, uh, only half, when they reviewed charts of people who would had a diagnosis of glaucoma, only half of them had had gonioscopy. That's ridiculous. So anyone with um, a diagnosis who's coming in being evaluated for ocular hypertension or, or glaucoma definitely needs to have gonioscopy performed. Um, and certainly anyone who's diabetic, uh, someone has a vein occlusion uh, who's at risk for neovascularization. I think I go you know, every diabetic every year. Uh,
another question about classification system, space system for sure, for me, harder to use, but it gives you so much more data. Um, so one question about a glass form your lens, uh, you know, the, the I love the, the Zeiss lens, which was glass on a handle. The problem with the Zeiss lens was that the mirrors were not attached as well as the plastic lenses now. And so um, uh, the mirrors would often start to fall off and uh, they, they really had a short lifespan, uh, but they were great for everything else. The view was great, indentation was great. Um, Why does the ciliary, why does angular recession have a paler ciliary body band? Because you're, you're looking at the ciliary body and, be, and the ciliary body is between you and the sclera. And if you tear into the ciliary body, you have less tissue between you and the white sclera. If you tear the ciliary body completely off the scleral spur, then that's a cyclodialysis cleft and it's white because you're looking right at, um, right at the sclera. How do you sterilize gonio prism? That's a great question. You can use uh, peroxide. I wipe mine with an uh, alcohol swab and let it air dry. Um, how do you examine the osteum after trabeculectomy just with a gonio lens? And should it be done routinely? I don't. I mean, if the pressure stays up even after suture lysis, then I'm wondering if maybe iris or something, fibrin is plugging it. Um, so then I would do a gonioscopy at that time. What is goniosynechiolysis? So that is a surgical technique uh, where one breaks peripheral anterior synechia, but that's a little beyond the scope of this lecture. Is it better to do gonioscopy in dilated or non-dilated? Definitely better to do it non-dilated before you dilate the patient because dilation moves the lens iris diaphragm back. Are uh, the contraindications apart from corneal surface disease? Uh, I can't think of any. Um, can you perform gonio with a soft contact lens instead of anesthetic? I guess so, I've never done that. I, I guess I really don't know that. And what do you think is a likely cause of blood in Schlem's canal? So that, that would be either there's too much, there's a high episcleral venous pressure. So thyroid eye disease, dural cavernous sinus fistula, CC fistula, or there's very low pressure inside the eye, like a hypotenuse eye. Uh, anytime that balance between the episcleral venous pressure and the intraocular pressure um, is uh, where the, uh, intraocular pressure is lower than episcleral venous pressure, then you'll see blood in, in Schlem's canal. And so it's usually high episcleral venous pressure. Let's see. Since pilocarpine can worsen pupillary block and cause iris bombay, why is it often used in angle closure? Well, so it can pull the iris out of the angle um, uh, the uh, pilocarpine can, um, but it, yeah, so it's kind of a two-edged sword. It moves the lens iris diaphragm forward, but also pulls the iris out of the angle. Um, it's not a, it is not a good long-term solution for people with narrow angles for sure. So pediatric patients, a couple of questions about pediatric patients. Um, and, uh, the, you know, uh, I've done kids in my clinic as young as four and five years old, but that's unusual that they're that mature and they let you do that. Um, the um, most pediatric patients uh, you need to do in the operating room and uh, an exam under anesthesia. Let's see, I think that answers most of these questions. So I have a few more since I, we have a few minutes. Um, maybe there are more questions here that I missed. 
Let's see, do I use pilocarpine prior to SLT? I do not. Uh, difference between iris, plateau iris and a grade one to two angle. Basically, plateau iris, you would have that role um, in the far periphery that we described. Um, how frequent are slit lamp grading and goniosity gradings different and which is most dependable? Um, they're rarely different in plateau iris, as I said, sometimes slit lamp will say the angles open when it's, when it's uh, very narrow. Uh, if you had to choose one, clearly gonioscopy is much better. Um, well, so when I asked to, to demonstrate Van Herrick again, I, I don't want to, I would ask you just to go to the, the uh, Iowa Glaucoma Curriculum website and it's right there. Uh, just, I, I, you know, I, I guess I have about six or seven more minutes. This is somebody with kogan reese syndrome. So you see in people who have ice syndrome, these really tall peripheral anterior sneaky that come up onto the cornea. This is Kogan and Reese's original drawing. Um, so, you know, if you have ice syndrome like this, it's pretty easy to make the diagnosis. But if you have ice syndrome like this, it's much harder. Somebody had thought this was angle closure, did an iridotomy, but if you look, they have this um, iris is distorted down here inferiorly. And then if you ever see this, where the iris comes up onto the cornea, you should be thinking ice syndrome because the cornea can't stick, the iris can't stick to the cornea unless there's a defect in the cornea. Like it would, if you have a flat chamber after, Trabeculectomy, it'll stick to the paracentesis site. But if you just have angle closure, it will only stick up as far as Schwalbe line. But if you have a sneaky that comes way up like that, you should think about ice syndrome. And this is that patient's um, specular microscopy. This is a great patient. This is a patient with aniridia. Um, again, for people who wanted to see the ciliary body, uh, so what you see in aniridia is a stub of iris. This person has a cataract and panis. Everyone always guesses that this is silicone oil, but it's in the wrong place, right? This is in the inferior angle, not the superior angle. So this is for fluorooctane that was used in a retinal detachment surgery. Somebody with a volcano um, this would be a high myope with angle closure, which would be spherophakia. And this is them dilated. Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. So this is a normal greater circle of the iris is really prominent here. And then these are iris processes up to, um, this ring of collagen in the, in the periphery. Another Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. Young patient with the kind of a scary looking lesion on their iris, 17 year old girl. Um, when you do gonioscopy, you can see that it not only goes into the angle but extends pretty far around the trabecular meshwork. Really cool pigmentary glaucoma picture shows the pigment in the angle and the shea stripe. The backbowing here. And really prominent shea stripe here particularly in countries where patients are really darkly pigmented, this is a great technique, finding the shea stripe to make the diagnosis of pigmentary. This is somebody with diffuse iris melanoma. Somebody had an interactive form body, you can see a little defect in their Iris there, they had a vitrectomy, lensectomy, but then they developed siderosis and 
we found this little piece of rusty lens that had been left behind. Which looks really cool on gonioscopy. Exfoliation syndrome, frosted zonules. So again, I, um, I'm i gonna stop there and um, because the time is almost up. I really appreciate everyone sending such great questions uh, and paying attention. I hope this has been helpful to people. Um, and the, um, uh, Everything that's on here that, that I've talked about, all these videos are on, on those two websites. So uh, feel free to check in there and if that, uh, that may answer any questions that you have.